And so moving on into the next chapter of Agamben's Homo Saker. Last time we discussed uh, the introduction. And now we're going to move into a discussion of chapter one, which is called the paradox of sovereignty. Now, the paradox of sovereignty will consist in the fact that the sovereign is both outside and inside the juridical order simultaneously. So that's the paradox that Agamben is going to draw our attention to. Um, and he starts off with the first sentence here by saying that the paradox of sovereignty consists in the fact that the sovereign is at the same time outside and inside the juridical order. So what does he mean by that and why is it important? He begins with a discussion of uh, Carl Schmitt's political theology. Carl Schmitt was a German theoretician. Uh, he came out of a Catholic background and he was a German theoretician who in the 1920s, uh, during the time of the Weimar Republic, was interested in figuring out ways of preserving the Weimar Republic against attacks. Uh, and I think he rightly perceived um, uh, with attacks on the far right and the far left that uh, the Weimar Republic could be in trouble. And so he wrote uh, two books. In 1921, he wrote uh, the Treatise on Dictatorship. Uh, and then in 1922, he wrote this famous treatise on political theology, which is a very short book. It's only four chapters. It can be read in one sitting, in which he there articulates um, the basic concept of the state of exception that uh, Agamben presupposes for the proper understanding of this chapter. Now, the state of exception is any kind of a political emergency that uh, presents the state with an imminent threat, such as an invasion or uh, anarchy, chaos, political uh, turmoil, rioting, and so forth. Anything that the state perceives as an imminent threat to its existence is a state of exception. And he starts off, Schmidt does, political theology by stating that the sovereign is one who decides on the exception, on the state of exception. So metaphysically speaking, what's interesting about the state of exception is that it constitutes the individual case that is outside the norm. And Schmidt was interested in the sort of uh, the state of exception as a singularity, as, a, as what is outside the norm. And he felt, I think, that most uh, theoreticians, especially of the liberal constitutional mentality, did not take sufficiently into account the, the potentiality and possibility for dismantling the state that a state of exception as a threat presented. I think he regarded let's say, the, the British uh, tradition with John Locke, uh, as, and even Immanuel Kant, he says, uh, did not take the state of exception into account. They're always concerned with legal norms, the juridical political order as an order of norms uh, that does not take into account what happens, what the state should do in the case of a state of exception, uh, which I think he right, obviously, in hindsight, he, he rightly saw that the, the state of exception in Germany in 1922 was on the way. Um, so the state of exception is an imminent threat, and the sovereign is the one who decides upon what to do about it. And so that's how Schmidt defines it in the first chapter of political theology. Now, he was essentially concerned with uh, a provision, the famous Article 48 in the Weimar Constitution of the Weimar Republic, that stipulated that the Reich's president could, uh, during an emergency, assume he had the right to suspend temporarily, either in part or in whole, the entire constitution, the, the, to, to suspend the, the system of rights and use armed forces as necessary to deal with the imminent threat. And so he focused on that Article 48 as the primary thing that would happen in, in the case of a state of, of exception. And initially, I think he saw the Nazis as a, as a threat, uh, both far left and far right, he saw as posing potential threats, even though later, of course, he joined the Nazi party once, once they ironically... Uh, took over uh, the Weimar Republic essentially and, and essentially became a living embodiment of precisely what he was talking about in this treatise in political theology. And so he was interested in, in um, <clears throat> uh, sort of a theory of finding out what would happen if the Reich's president was presented with an imminent threat. He should be granted full, absolute, unlimited powers to deal with the state of exception and not be hampered by the checks and balances of the parliamentary system, specifically the Reichstag. Um, and so he wanted to make it clear that for him, the sovereign is he, essentially the sovereign slumbers during the period of so-called normalcy, the normal constitutional order, but the sovereign comes to awaken during periods of exceptionality, stakes of exceptionality. It's a little bit like Thomas Kuhn's distinction in the structure of scientific revolutions between normal science, where things are going along status quo, and then you hit a paradigm shift with revolutionary science. The state of exception is sort of a political equivalent of that. Indeed, I think that Schmidt is coming out of a tradition in German thinking that is very much inclined toward volcanism, toward sort of uh, catastrophism in the sciences in both biology and geology. The German mentality had a kind of interest and predisposition toward catastrophism, as did the French 
Not so much the British, though, uh, for whom the earth was uniformitarian, and they saw, and politically, they, they thought of everything as slow, gradual, uniformitarian changes. But the Germans and also the French did not think that way, and this may be the only two similarities that the two, the Germans and the French, have in common, is the tendency to think in terms of political catastrophism and to take it into account. So Schmidt felt that the, the architects of liberal constitutionalism did not take sufficiently enough into account what would happen if a state of exception emerged and the Reich's president was not granted full power to deal with it. And so the way he saw it, the Reich's president needed to have complete unlimited power to deal with the imminent threat to the state uh, and to declare a state of exception and to decide on it. And essentially uh, then, so what Agamben does in this first chapter is then to examine Schmidt's definition of sovereignty and he seizes on there this idea that the sovereign is both inside and outside the juridical order. It's an undecidable. The sovereign is uh, outside the juridical order because he has the power to suspend it. Um, Schmidt made a distinction in his essay on dictatorship between two different types of sovereign, the, uh, the, the dictatorial sovereign or the sovereign dictator, um, who has the power not only to suspend the constitution but actually to abrogate it and wipe it away and put in a new one, versus the commissarial dictator who had the power simply to suspend the Constitution and do take whatever measures were necessary to preserve it, which is essentially what Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution was. It, it allowed a provision for a commissarial dictator to come in and uh, suspend the Constitution and take necessary measures to, to preserve it. And so what Agamben is interested in is this idea then that the sovereign is both inside and outside because he, he has the power to suspend the juridical political order, so he's therefore outside of it, but he's also inside of it for obvious reasons, since he's part of the whole, he's, a, he's part of the whole state machinery, the whole apparatus of the state. So he's both outside and inside simultaneously. That's the paradox of sovereignty that Agamben is after uh, in this chapter. And one of the reasons why he does this, why he starts with the sovereign being a kind of Derridian undecidable, is that Homo Saker is the figure at the opposite extreme from the sovereign. Uh, they form a symmetry. Uh, because both of them are undecidables. Both of them are simultaneously inside and outside the juridical order. Um, the homo sacer is inside the juridical order uh, in the sense that the order has to take him into account and figure out what to do with him, but by declaring him to be outside that order, obviously homo sacer for obvious reasons, since the juridical political machinery has been withdrawn from him and he remains exposed so that anyone can kill him with impunity is also outside that order. So he too is an undecidable as well as uh, the state of exception with the sovereign who is both inside and outside. So it's a question for Agamben, of, and it's a very important question of finding out who's on the inside of the juridical political order and who's on the outside. And of course, in this respect, we see him as a sort of inheritor of the Derridian legacy of deconstruction, because for Derrida, the whole essence of deconstruction is to take a metaphysical system, which Derrida sees as composed of polar opposites like uh, right versus fact, or inside versus outside, or male versus female, one of whose terms in that polarity is always privileged over the other, as in the logocentric tradition where the voice uh, is always privileged over writing. And to deconstruct that system by dismantling uh, the absolute tension uh, that one finds between those polar opposites, and to render it in such a way that we see that the two polar opposites really do not constitute an opposition after all, since the one can be found inside the other. And then we then wind up with these undecidables, these things that can't fit, metaphysically speaking, into one, into an either-or system of metaphysical binaries. So that begins to announce the end of the metaphysical age. It's dismantling. Once you start dismantling those binary systems, you're moving into an age of chaos and thermodynamic equilibrium in which all the structural uh, oppositions and polarities that built metaphysical systems begin to entwine and interfuse. And I think the state of exception interestingly enough, is a way that uh, the state sort of naturally deconstructs itself. It loses its tension between outside and inside, between right and fact. It loses the tension and it begins to create with the state of exception a zone of indistinguishability between inside and outside. And the, that zone of indistinguishability, which is a kind of uh, juridical chaos, uh, is the state of exception that the sovereign finds himself uh, in control of or in command of. But that zone of exception also indicates, of course, the eruption of uh, zoology, essentially bare naked life, 
into the political arena, uh, where the outside, that which is on beyond the pale, the wild, begins to erupt and interpenetrate with that which is on the inside of the juridical political machinery. And so it's very important that Agamben does a sort of deconstruction on this and traces the, the sort of archaeology of how this all comes to be. Um, and so he says here that the relation between then the state of exception, which is the individual case versus the norm, is that of a relation of exception, which is how he defines it, a relation of exception in which the norm relates to the exception precisely by withdrawing from it. And so in withdrawing from it, it creates this state of exception, which Agamben says essentially is, um, though it exists as a zone of indistinguishability between right or law and fact, or the uh, abnormality of the situation that the sovereign finds himself dealing with, once that zone opens up, it essentially opens up a zone of indistinguishability which is non-localizable. And so you'll find that Agamben is always concerned here with topology and the opening up of spaces. And he'll say essentially that the concentration camp, as he says about midway in this chapter, the concentration camp is the physical topology, the opening up of the zone, or at least the closest thing uh, that one can come to creating the physical equivalent of a zone of political indistinguishability, which is really non-localizable, but the camp is the closest thing toward localizing it, whereas the prison, as a space of confinement uh, at, that Foucault studied, for instance, is not a zone of indistinguishability since penal law applies there perfectly clearly, and it's a zone of order and confinement, whereas the concentration camp operates under martial law and the state of siege, uh, which is a state of total, um, not, it might not be total anarchy, but it's, it's close to it, and it's a zone of indistinguishability um, in which the outside and the inside are becoming thermodynamically and tropically intermixed. And essentially entropy is what happens as a system loses its tension between the, bio, the, the bipolarity of hot and cold. Uh, once it loses that tension and, there, and the hot and cold particles become intermixed, you have maximum entropy or thermodynamic equilibrium. And that's essentially what you also get in a state of exception. You have a kind of uh, political entropy or thermodynamic equilibrium to which the only response, as Schmidt saw it, was to grant the Reich's president full powers of a dictator, uh, although it was limited to as a commissarial dictatorship who could only suspend the constitution and take whatever means necessary to preserve it. And I think that the German state later, this, this will have implications in when the GDR has to deal with the Bader meinhof terrorist group, where they came very close uh, to declaring a state of martial law and, and a state of exception in dealing with that imminent threat. And Schmidt was also the one, by the way, who came up with this idea of the friend-foe definition of politics, which had hitherto, prior to the 20s, been applied to uh, interstate warfare, but it hadn't been applied until uh, 1927 when Schmidt came up with it for defining uh, the friend-foe uh, enemy of the state idea, domestically speaking, the state is the only sole entity. It has not only a monopoly of power, but it has, according to Schmidt, the monopoly for deciding who is a friend of the state and who is a foe. And if it decides internally to the state that there is an enemy to the state, then it has the right to take measures to deal with it. And it does that, Schmidt felt, through uh, awakening the dictatorial powers of the sovereign, which uh, at, at his time, when the time when he wrote political theology was the, uh, the Reich's president. When Hitler came along and became a living embodiment, essentially, of the, the very thing that he was preparing Germany for in this political treatise, and this treatise was written in 1922, one year after Walter Benjamin wrote his Critique of Violence in 1921, which I don't think that Schmidt read. Schmidt was a, was a good German anti-Semite. Um, I don't think he would have bothered reading something like that. Uh, by Walter Benjamin. But nonetheless, and, and we'll see how uh, the contrast between Benjamin's critique of violence uh, makes a kind of theological justification for violence, for revolutionary violence, divine violence as he calls it, versus uh, Schmidt's political theology. And the theology here, by the way, is the idea from Schmidt that um, all the main concepts of politics are secularized theological concepts. The obvious one being the, the sovereign who is like God, who has the right to, to make uh, sort of apodictic pronunciations, um, but also the idea that the state of exception is, is theologically equivalent to the miracle that erupts into a system as a singularity and changes the system. So uh, from both far right and far left here at the same time, we have these sort of theological arguments for 
um, divine intervention, as it were. So we'll look at that, and um, we'll look at Benjamin's critique of violence uh, in a few chapters here as Agamemnon works his way toward it.